Dr. Sullivan here. Thank you so much for joining me for lecture seven. This one is really, really important. I know I'm saying that about all of them, but I know that a lot of you are spending a lot of wasted money on memory related products. So the first thing I wanna help you do is understand the concept of memory. Memory is very complex. It's not as easy as you have a good memory or you have a bad memory. I wanna help you understand exactly what the brain fitness industry is promising you about memory and how they're failing time and time again. I wanna give you the bottom line on memory supplements, brain games, and brain training. We're gonna conclude with recommendations based in science that are actually going to help you improve your memory starting today. So if you've been with us for some of our other lectures, you know that the brain fitness industry is an eight to $10 billion industry. And a lot of it is based on claims about memory. So the first thing I want us to think about is how has this happened? Why have all of these memory products popped up? I want us to think about why this has happened. What has gone on in our society to make this industry be able to flourish in the way that it has? In the last 10 years alone, there's been 20 failed trials for dementia-related medications. This has really set the stage for supplements to come right on in and swoop up this part of the market. Many brain experts argue that the claims made by memory products on today's market are exaggerated and sometimes even downright fraudulent. These so-called smart drugs that you might see at your grocery store or the local drug store have failed in clinical trials. Not one of them has a strong scientific leg to stand on, but yet they're marketed to you as if they're absolutely guaranteed to work, and it's just not the case. There's so many things that you can start to do today that are 100% free that I promise you will genuinely help your memory. So let's get started. One of the things I'm really interested in is the anxiety that's behind the success of this industry. And if you start to pay attention, you're gonna notice that the way we talk about dementia has a lot of fear in it. We talk about things like the looming epidemic, the dementia time bomb that's about to go off. And this feeds the concept that dementia is the most terrifying thing that can happen to us. Now, I've been personally affected by dementia and I see it every day in my practice. I'm absolutely not standing here telling you that it's a walk in the park. Dementia can provide us with some of the most heartbreaking life experiences that we can ever have. But part of why this industry has flourished is because of our fear of that happening to us and the people that we love. In 2007, there was a survey done on over 1,000 older adults, and they cited dementia as their number one fear. Now, this is above things like fear of a terrorist attack, and I think that that really says a lot about the stage that is set for marketers to come in with all of their big promises. We are absolutely petrified, and when you don't have good quality information to rely on, it's very easy to buy these false promises. What is concerning to me is that over 60% of older adults take some kind of supplement that they believe is improving the health of their brain. Many scientists feel strongly that the only way that we're gonna combat this exploitation is through knowledge. And that is the biggest reason that I developed this program. I desperately want you to know real, valid, scientifically based information about the brain so you can make more informed choices and figure out where it is you wanna spend your time and your money. The first thing that we have to talk about is what is memory? What is the definition of memory? At its most basic, memory is the ability to remember information when we need it. There's a structure in the brain called the hippocampus, and actually we have two on each sides of our brain. And this is the area of the brain where we learn new information and help to move it into long-term storage. This is where we go from a short-term memory into a long-term memory. The hippocampus helps us put memories into the gray matter of our brain. In a previous lecture, I used the analogy of a librarian looking for her books. So the hippocampus is part of that subcortical part of the brain, that white matter, and that's the librarian. She's gotta go out and store her books and find them when a person comes in looking for that specific book. The gray matter is where she's storing her books. So the hippocampus helps us take information and helps us make a long-term record of it. 
I really want you to understand how complex memory is. Think of all the different things that we have to do to make a memory. The first thing is that you have to simply perceive it. This requires that you hear it, or you see it, or you smell it, or you feel it. If there are sensory problems, which we know vision and hearing loss are common as we get older, right there we can start off having a problem with memory. After we've successfully encoded or learned something, there's a next step. Once we've decided that we're interested in something, we have to focus our attention on that specific thing. Think of how much information is coming at you every second of the day. You have to somehow be able to close in your lens and focus on that specific information that you want to learn. Once you've paid good enough attention to it, you actually have to put it into your memory banks. Then your brain has to make the memory and then it stores the memory. Later on, when you want to retrieve that memory, there's a whole nother set of processes that happen. So let's talk about those. The first thing is that you have to be able to find the memory. So if we use that librarian metaphor again, she has to be able to go to where the book is located and pull it down from the shelf. Sometimes this can go wrong as people get older, and a delay in the retrieval of this information can be really frustrating. But if people are patient and they wait just a couple minutes, it typically pops right in. Sometimes when there's trouble with retrieval, and we give a person a little bit of a clue or a hint, they can actually more readily access the information. They can find the book more quickly. We might say it's located on aisle 1B, that's where you're gonna go. The final part of memory is recognition, and that's just simply knowing if you have heard that information before. This is a part of what neuropsychologists specialize in, is through our standardized paper and pencil testing, we can understand exactly where memory is breaking down. And that's critical because that pattern is what tells us what parts of the brain are not working like they should. There's a big difference in difficulty perceiving, in learning, in retrieving, and recognizing. So you've probably heard of the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory. But of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So within long-term memory, we have implicit memory and explicit memory. Implicit memory is much more unconscious. It's things that we know that we don't even realize that we know. You can classify something called procedural memory under implicit memory. And what this means are things that we just know how to do. Riding a bike is a perfect example. Someone getting on a piano who's played for 30 years, they can play out those songs without really trying in many cases. It's just things that we very naturally know how to do without much effort. Explicit memory are things that we know we know. So we know, I remember yesterday, we had pancakes for breakfast. You're able to call up those memories at will. Within explicit memory, there's something called declarative memory. Now declarative memory are the facts that we know about how the world works. Now it gets even broken down further between something called episodic memory and semantic memory. And I promise we're almost done with this part. Episodic memory are things like our memories for experiences, for events. When I remember going to my first Bon Jovi concert, that is an explicit memory. That is an episodic memory. Under semantic memory, these are things like being able to recite the Declaration of Independence. They're facts that we've stored in our mind that when we want to, we can call up from memory. So I hope these last few minutes have helped you gotten a little bit better of an understanding of how complex memory is and how if you're worried about memory in yourself or someone else, it's really not as simple as, well, if it's not working good, it must be dementia. It's absolutely critical to figure out where in that complex chain of events the memory problem is coming from. Brain scientists know that attention and concentration are the gateways to memory. Remember a few minutes ago I said, if you don't pay attention and you don't focus on something, you simply cannot make a memory of it. Think of how many things happen to you every day that in a week you have no memory of. That's because they didn't matter to you. They were inconsequential. 
The thing is though, we have control over our attention. We can decide that we want to pay better attention. We can decide that a set of information is relevant and important to us. And that control of turning attention on and off is so important when you wanna improve your memory. Many times when people come to see me as a neuropsychologist, I wind up telling them you actually have an attention problem or an organizational problem. It's actually not a memory problem. The problem is that they're just not learning the information well enough to be able to make the memory. And part of this is that our attention is very limited. Our attention is thought to have about seven slots. That's the average for a given person. And this makes a lot of sense when you start to think about phone numbers. If you remember before phone numbers had area codes, we remembered a lot of people's phone numbers. That's those special seven digits. That's just a number that our brain is very comfortable remembering and manipulating. Do you remember the switch that happened when we started using area codes? It was very difficult to remember people's phone numbers because it was information overload. I think older adults are very keenly aware of how much faster life is coming at us than it did even 10 or 20 years ago. It's very, very hard to pay proper attention to everything that we need to in life. So I wanna go through with you some of the most typical complaints about memory that I hear from my patients that are actually completely normal. So this is the reassuring part of the lecture. So you might have heard of amnesia, right? This is the clinical scientific term for a loss of memory. Many patients come to see me and they are worried about something that we call roomnesia, of walking into a room and having no earthly idea what it is you came into that room for, okay? Typically, that is a problem with attention, that when you had that idea about getting up, you started thinking about other things, you didn't rehearse it in your mind, you just got up on automatic pilot and found yourself in the living room. If this is where your memory concerns begin and end, you're probably doing just fine. The next one is called parkingnesia. This happens to us when we come home from a trip at the airport or even a trip to the local super mall. Why this is a common complaint is that the visual environment in which we parked our car looks very, very similar. There's not too many things that stand out as different to grab our attention. We're thinking about what we're gonna get in the store, we're maybe thinking about how hungry we are and how there's a great smell in the air, and we're just on autopilot, not really concentrating on where we park that car. When we come out, we see a sea of other cars and it takes us a couple minutes to figure out where is it that we left our car. Again, if this is where your memory problems begin and end, you're probably fine. The why am I always losing things syndrome. If your desk looks like this picture, there's a good chance you might have an organizational problem, not a memory problem. The last one is this problem with word finding, particularly for people's names. That is a normal part of brain aging. I can assure you if you're an older adult and you are embarrassed about not remembering the names of acquaintances, this is happening to many of your friends. Now, if you have a hard time remembering people very close to you, grandchildren's names, children's names, that is something to be concerned about. But if it's someone you see in passing not very frequently, or if you live in a retirement community and you're around hundreds of people every day, you really can't be expected to learn all of those different pieces of information and be able to call it up on a moment's notice. So let's look at the memory market in more detail. I kind of think of it as falling into two categories. The first one are prescription medications, and the second one are supplements. Prescription medications are medications that are approved through the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and they have to go through very rigorous scientific testing to prove their safety and their value. When we think about memory, there's two types of memory products that are on the market. And if you know anyone who's been diagnosed with specific types of dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, the gold standard definition of care at this point is treatment with one or two of these medications, depending on what stage of dementia the person is in. So the first class of medication increases the availability of a chemical messenger called acetylcholine in the brain. These medications are sold both as brand names and as generic. The generics go by the names of dinepazil, galantamine, and the third one is rivastigmine. 
The second class of medications affects a chemical in the brain called glutamate. The most common of these medications is Nemenda or Memantine. Up until recently, the gold standard of care was a medication like Dinepazil in the mild stages of dementia and only for specific subtypes like Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia. Then when somebody progressed to more moderate symptoms of dementia, a medication like Nemenda was added. Recently, the recommendations changed, and now what we think of as being the best possible medications for people with dementia are something that we call combination therapy, and this is actually a combination of Dinepazil and Nemenda taken together. How these medications work is they don't actually treat the disease process that's happening in the brain, but what they do offer us is our best bet at prolonging the quality of life the person has and the levels of symptoms that they have when they first start to take the medications. And this is why early diagnosis of dementia is so critical. Now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the memory supplements that are on the market. What we know when we look at the scientific literature is that there is very little scientific evidence to support any memory medication that's on the market today. There is some very limited evidence and some glimmer of hope for some single ingredients that are in these products, but not one medication that's on the market today has passed the high levels that are set forth by science as a safe and efficacious treatment of memory. In science, we get the most reassurance from something that we call double-blind placebo-based studies. This means that neither side, either the patient or the investigator, knows if someone's getting a placebo or a sugar pill or if they're getting the experimental drug. This really helps to reduce bias. What we have to do in science is prove the medication is safe and effective at lower levels. We typically start in animals, and over time, we eventually get into what we call population-based studies, and this is our guarantee to the public that these medications are safe and that they actually work. No memory medication on the market that you can get without a prescription has come even close to passing this standard, but you wouldn't know that if you just listened to their marketing pitches. So if you go to the companion workbook, I want you to see this graph that I've put in there for you that was published by Harvard's Men's Health in 2012. What you have in the top row is a list of the most common supplements that people take, assuming it's going to improve memory and overall brain health. What I want you to notice is how there is no scientific support for any one of these supplements with the exception of vitamin E. And it's really important that you understand that specific study before you go thinking that taking vitamin E every day is going to significantly improve your brain. These studies were based on a very small group of patients with Alzheimer's disease, and it was at levels of vitamin E that were so high that they were actually considered to be toxic to the person's body. But this is actually a perfect example of what the brain fitness industry does. It takes a little pearl of wisdom, a little finding, and it extrapolates it for profit. If you remember about 10 years ago, vitamin E was the big one-hit wonder for memory. That was really one of the supplements that started this whole craze about trying to help your memory through a pill. We've now moved on to other things like coconut oil and turmeric, and we're gonna cover all of that in today's lecture. There's another thing that's really important that you have to know if you're gonna think like a brain scientist, and that is to really judge the quality of a research study. One of the aspects of a research study that impresses us as a scientist is when they have a large number of people in the research sample. When you find a positive result, but it's only based on eight to 20 people in your group, it's really hard to think that that's gonna be meaningful for the general public. So when we think about our next supplement, which is ginkgo biloba, now this kind of took the place of vitamin E. I kind of think of it as the next craze in brain pill health. In 2008, the Journal of the American Medical Association looked at 3,000 people on ginkgo biloba supplements, and they followed them over time to see if it had any effect whatsoever on changing their risk of developing dementia. And what the scientists concluded is that there was no scientific basis for the claims that ginkgo biloba specifically helped to reduce the incidence of dementia. The next three that we're gonna talk about right now are really in vogue as we speak. And these are fish oil supplements, turmeric, and coconut oil. 
These are billion dollar industries in and of themselves. So I know that either you or somebody that you care about is taking one of these three supplements right now. Now, turmeric right now is all the rage, and there's been a lot of small studies that have come out that have been basically inconclusive, with some showing some benefits and others showing no benefit at all. The idea behind turmeric and all of these curry-type compounds is that they expand the blood vessels in the body and make it so more of that oxygen and glucose-rich blood can move throughout the body, including the brain. In 2017, a meta-analysis came out that took all of the research studies that have been done on turmeric and collapsed the highest quality ones together to get those numbers up to really try to look at the effects. And what they reported is that there was no therapeutic value to taking turmeric in regards to brain health. This was looking at thousands of research studies and over 120 clinical trials. This was published in the Journal of Medical Chemistry and the authors concluded by saying this, previous findings that suggested a value to turmeric for brain health have been hyped up and incorrectly translated into the media. The bottom line for me on turmeric is it doesn't seem to hurt, but I certainly don't want you buying it, taking it every day with the false promise that it's actually going to affect the quality of your brain health. The problems are the claims, saying that it can reverse dementia, that it can prevent dementia, that is absolute fraud. Now there may be some therapeutic or medicinal value to the fact that it opens up blood vessels a little bit, but you just have to remember when the claim is extreme, it's very unlikely likely that it's true. Let's talk about fish oil supplements. Again, I know a lot of you are taking these. There have been several observational studies that when you look at the blood of older adults, those who have higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the blood do tend to be healthier from a cardiovascular standpoint. And this includes a decreased risk of dementia. What I want you to focus on in that study that I just mentioned is the word observational. What this means is that there was simply a relationship that was found between cardiovascular health and high levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the blood. What we don't know from those studies is if there is in fact a cause and effect relationship. We don't know if it was the omega-3 fatty acids in the blood that resulted in the cardiovascular health. It could be something else about that population that they do in another aspect of their life that is actually resulting in improved cardiovascular health. For example, maybe people that take those fish oil supplements are more likely to be exercisers. Maybe they're more likely to get out and to bike and to swim and to walk, and that's actually the effect that we're seeing there. So what we like to do in science is to try to really find the most rigorous methods for understanding how a chemical like a supplement works in actual human beings in a controlled environment. Remember a minute ago I was telling you about something called a meta-analysis where all sorts of research studies that are of a good enough quality get collapsed together so we can really get some big numbers to understand the effects of a substance on behavior? In 2012, this was actually done on fish oil supplements. Over the age of 60, that took fish oil supplements from anywhere from six to 40 months. And what they did is follow them over time, and they did not find that they had any decreased incidence of dementia. Now again, for me, the bottom line is we might just not know enough about how this substance affects the brain. I certainly think that there's some promise there, but I don't want you to become overly reliant on something like one pill to affect the health of your brain. I think that it's too soon to tell the true evidence base of fish oil supplements, but what a lot of brain scientists believe is that you're much better off actually eating fish in your diet. And what we think are the most healthy fishes to eat are those that actually are high in oil like sardines and anchovies. Now, of course, we've got a whole nother problem with eating fish. We have polluted our oceans and our riverways so much that it's very hard to get fish that does not have high levels of different types of heavy metals, including mercury. And that is a whole field of research in and of itself. We know that heavy metals very much affect the brain, especially the brains of developing babies. One good rule of thumb is to try to eat fish that are as small as possible. The idea is that the bigger fish, in order to survive to grow so big, have been eating a lot of other little fishes. And over time, what happens are these big fish have much higher levels of the heavy metals 
in them that you are then ingesting. So again, this gets back to the anchovies, not my favorite, the sardines, any type of little oily fish is thought to be the best for brain health at this time. Proponents of coconut oil feel that it's rich in medium chain triglycerides, which are metabolized differently than most fats and break down into ketones and are used by the brain as quote unquote secondary fuel. The claims are that it treats and even prevents dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, that it improves brain health. As of 2017, there's inadequate evidence to suggest that coconut oil is effective for treating any brain condition. There have been no rigorous, large-scale research studies done. It's not approved by the FDA for use as a treatment in any kind of ailment, including brain health. Now I wanna to talk to you about a really popular over-the-counter supplement that claims to help with memory and even reduce your chances of getting dementia. In 2017, the Federal Trade Commission and the Attorney General of New York charged the makers of this product with making false and unsubstantiated claims. Specifically that the product improves memory, has cognitive benefits, and is clinically proven to work. The complaint alleges that the marketers relied on a very small and flawed study to make their claims. At the end of the publicly offered statement from these folks was a really important message that I want all of you to hear. The marketers preyed on the fears of older adults who are worried about age-related memory loss. One thing that these marketers forgot is that their claims actually have to be based on solid scientific evidence. And my thought at this time is that all the other memory supplements, the over-the-counters that you see in the grocery store and in the drugstore can also be classified in this exact same way. The idea is that we can use the same type of fitness training for the brain that works for the body. The belief behind neurobics is that the harder we work our brain, the more strenuous cognitive lifting we do through brain teasers and puzzles, the stronger our brain is going to be. The problem with all of the brain fitness products on the market today is that yes, there is some scientific evidence showing that you will get better at their game, but what we're all waiting for, what we're all wanting to be impressed with is that their brain fitness program generalizes to real life, that it actually makes you better Better at things you do in your everyday life outside this game. In 2009, a meta-analysis came out suggesting that there was no brain fitness product on the market that slowed or reduced people's chance of getting dementia. Now I want to talk to you about probably the most popular brain game on the market today, and that's Lumosity. In 2016, federal investigators hit the makers of this program with a $50 million fine for making fraudulent claims. The company, however, said that they couldn't afford that and it was reduced to a $2 million penalty that they did pay. In addition, they also offered to change some of the wording on their website to be more accurate and to not be quite so exaggerated. I want you to take a look at this quote on the screen from the director of the Federal Trade Commission Bureau on Consumer protection. Just read that for yourself and see what conclusions you come to. So as a result, if you go on their website now, they are actually mandated to put in the following clause. Lumosity is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Now let's transition into the recommendations part of the lecture. What is it that you need to be doing starting today to truly improve your memory? I promise that you can improve your memory if you use these three principles with effort, motivation, and daily practice. The first thing is you have got to address those hearing and vision problems that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. If your brain is not using quality information to try to learn and remember, you're already at a disadvantage. So for yourself or someone that you care about, you want to try in the most helpful way possible to get them to use their glasses and their hearing aids every single day. It's critically important to take an interest in the things that you want to remember. Remember earlier in the lecture, we talked about how many things are coming at us all day long. We have to pick and choose what it is that we're going to give the precious resource of our attention to. So what I want you to start doing is to truly try to pay attention. I want you to transition from simply receiving information to actively engaging with information. And we talked about this a few lectures back. It's really important that you become an active listener, not just a passive receptacle of information. So 
let me teach you the skill of active listening. The first thing is that I want you to feel comfortable asking questions. This is how we personalize information and more actively engage with it. If someone's talking to you for a long period of time, it's just human nature that you're gonna zone out and not really pay attention. You're gonna start to think about what you're gonna have for lunch, maybe who you're gonna meet later in the day. It's very important that you stay actively engaged going back and forth with questions. Many times we're not exactly sure of what a person had to say, and it's perfectly okay to ask them to clarify. If you didn't catch what they said, it's really okay to ask them to repeat themselves. This shows that we're interested in what it is that they have to say. And when you are listening to someone, I really want you to focus on their words. So many of us are guilty of just waiting for our turn to jump in, rehearsing in our mind exactly what it is we wanna to contribute to the conversation just as long as that person pauses to take a breath. That is very distracting and it's going to get in your way of remembering in the future what was said during this conversation. So if you can really try to tune in to what the other person is saying and not be so preoccupied with what it is you're going to offer, you will be much better at learning that information. So remember earlier when I said attention is the key to memory, that it's really the bridge that makes us learn and remember? Well, attention has two parts. The first one, of course, is the paying attention. But the other part that we don't think of as often is ignoring the distractions. And I wanna talk about how is it that you can do that a little bit better. So if you listen to my lecture on normal changes that happen in brain function as we get older, you might remember that one of the things that does mildly decline is our ability to successfully multitask. And one thing that you can do that will really help yourself is to try to minimize the distractions in your environment. And the way you're gonna do this is to try to simplify what you're seeing and hearing when you are receiving important information. You can use this either for yourself or when you're trying to have an important conversation with a loved one. It's really not a great idea to have the TV on, to have someone on their phone or on their computer when you're trying to tell them something that you want them to remember, like an important medical appointment. What you wanna do is minimize all those distractions, have no other noises in the environment, alert the person that you're about to tell them something really important that they need to try to remember. You're much more likely to have the person actually make a memory of what you're saying if you have their full attention. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is are you being distracted by your own body? You have to make sure that you are in good physical and mental condition when you sit down to learn something. Remember, if you never learn it in the first place, you're not going to successfully make a memory of it to remember later. The first thing I want you to do is just check in with yourself. Am I hungry? Am I in pain? Am I tired? These are three contexts that are very poor for new learning. It's very important that you're as comfortable as you can possibly be, that your stress level is relatively reduced, and that you are in a space where you can actually focus on what's being said. Just the simple act of repeating information and making connections in information that you're trying to learn to things that you already know, things that you already have in your memory banks is a really effective, helpful way to improve your memory now. The way that brain cells are set up is that they're all about interconnections. If you look at the picture in your workbook and on the screen right now, I'm gonna remind you about what neurons or brain cells look like. And what I want you to focus on are all those little spindly bits in the top and on the bottom of these brain cells. Those are the dendrites and the axon terminals that allow brain cells to communicate with one another. One brain cell does very little. It is networks of brain cells that have to communicate together in order for us to learn and to remember. The way that brain cells communicate is by making connections. Connecting to be learned information with something that you already know. So you always wanna try to tie back information to something that you already know. So the way you're gonna set yourself up for memory success every day is by thinking of your internal environment 
and your external environment. You're gonna work in an area that's free of distractions, that's clean and clear. You're gonna make sure that you're in a good mental state, you're not too hungry, you're not too tired, you're not too anxious, you're not too stressed. You can hear as well as you can, you can see as well as you can. That has to be first things first when it comes to learning and memory. Now we're gonna talk about two types of memory strategies. And again, we're gonna use those same ideas of internal and external for our memory strategies. We're gonna talk about strategies that you can generate within yourself. And we're gonna also talk about external aids to help support your memory. We're gonna talk about three internal memory strategies. The first one is called the first letter strategy. And there's a good chance that maybe you've already tried this, but until you know that it's scientifically proven, maybe you're not using it as often as you should because it's really a good support for memory. The idea is if you're having a hard time coming up with a name, for example, what you really need is a bit of a jump start. You need that clue, you need that reminder to get that memory to pop out. If we go back to our librarian metaphor, you need to get a little bit of fire under that librarian's butt to go out and find that book. So what you're gonna do is go through the alphabet and not just say the letter of the alphabet. What I want you to do is say the sound of each letter in the alphabet. And I promise you, if you go through the alphabet twice and you still don't have the word, I would be pretty surprised if what you're dealing with is normal age-related memory loss. The next internal strategy is association. And we've covered this one a little bit before, but basically the idea is you have to relate information you're trying to learn to something that you already know. So let's say for example, a brand new car comes on the market and you really think it's pretty cool, but you cannot remember the name of this car. If you look at it close enough, you might be reminded that it actually reminds you of the Buick that you used to have back in the 90s. Maybe the name of this car also starts with a B. So every time you see that car, you're reminded of a memory that you've already had in your brain, provides you with a little bit of the jumpstart that you need to find that word. And the third internal memory strategy that we're gonna talk about is clustering. The idea is that you wanna group large amounts of information into smaller, more manageable chunks. If you think of yourself trying to learn a phone number, for example, what we typically do is give those numbers a little bit of a cadence in the way that we say them. So for example, we don't say something like two, six, nine, five, nine, oh, five. We say it more like two, six, nine, 5905. This is an internal strategy that the brain uses to try to make it more manageable and remember information in smaller packets. So if you've been with us from the beginning, you are very educated about this concept of cognitive reserve, but let's just go over it quickly. So the idea is that the more deposits you put into your brain bank over time, the more likely your brain is going to be able to withstand the damage that occurs due to different brain diseases, specifically dementia. So what we wanna do is use the three principles of neuroplasticity so the deposits that you're putting into your brain bank are as good as they possibly can be. The first thing is you want to do an activity more over time. Repetition is absolutely critical for learning and developing new memories. The next thing is over time, you actually want to make the learning harder and harder. You don't wanna start off with something too hard because you're gonna get frustrated and not wanna continue it. So you really gotta to try to find that sweet spot for you between too easy and too hard. When you're in that zone, I think you can almost feel the wheels turning in your brain. The third principle is that we want the information that we learn to be unique or novel. So what this means is you don't want to do the same thing over and over again, but you also have to keep it somewhat in the ballpark. So let's just use piano playing as an example. What would be a great brain health exercise? Would be someone who played piano in their youth. Maybe over the last few decades they got away from it and it's just not a hobby that they do much of anymore. But I guarantee you, if you sit down most people at a piano who used to be piano players, a lot of it will come rushing back. And what they're doing is activating these old brain networks, but they're adding in new information. And that is very, very powerful for increasing the strength of brain connections. 
Over time, what I would encourage the person to do after remembering some of the standards is to try to actually learn a new song. Now, we don't wanna go into something too complicated, but we also don't wanna just keep them on the standards that they already knew when they started. The next recommendation for memory is good old cardiovascular exercise. We've talked about this before, but it really merits a review. There are both direct and indirect benefits of exercise on the brain, and specifically for memory. Let's talk about some of the direct effects first. The most important thing is that exercises increases our brain's access to the fuels that it needs in order to work properly. Of course, this is blood and oxygen. You know this by now. It reduces the amount of inflammation in our brain, again, probably through better circulation. Now, some of that we've reviewed before, but I wanna give you some new information in this lecture. What's really cool about exercise and memory is that we know when people exercise, particularly vigorously and over time, they're actually increasing the amount of nerve growth hormone in their brain. And this is the very substance that brain cells need in order to grow those new connections. There's good evidence that after six to 12 months of moderately intense exercise, the size of the hippocampus, the memory centers in the brain, actually increases. Of course, there's indirect benefits to exercise too. It really helps with our mood, it really helps with our sleep, and those two things, as you know, are critical for memory. In one of our last lectures, we focused on the effects of chronic stress. And if you were tuning in, you know that stress is pretty bad for the body overall, and specifically the brain. We know that there are both short-term consequences and long-term. One of the worst consequences of long-term stress is that it truly does affect our memory. We know that stress hormones over time damage the memory centers of the brain. You might wanna look back from our notes from lecture five to remind yourself what we talked about in that lecture. I know that many of you are interested in diet. What are the kind of foods that you're supposed to be eating to best support memory? Well, the diet that has the strongest evidence base is something called the MIND diet. So let's talk about it, the M-I-N-D diet. A study came out in 2015 that showed that people that really strictly adhered to this diet had a 50% less chance of developing dementia, and those people who followed it moderately had about a 35% decreased chance of developing dementia. So if you look in your companion workbook, you're gonna see this diet pretty nicely laid out. What I'm gonna go over with you here is just some of the basics, but it's really something that deserves your attention and I want you to take the time in the future to look into it in great detail. Like many of the healthy diets, it's based in whole food eating with a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits. It also incorporates nuts and healthy oils like olive oil, and it recommends a glass of red wine per day. The next recommendation is I want you to be mindful about the way that you talk about yourself and your memory. There's some really interesting psychological studies that showed when older adults are exposed to either negative or positive words associated with aging, their ability to remember new information changes. In this study, when older adults were shown positive words about aging, like sage and wisdom, they remembered more words and they actually walked faster as opposed to being shown words that were negative about aging, like words like dementia, senile, and confused. So what I take from that study is we have to watch our words. Instead of saying things to yourself like, oh, I'll never remember that. I'm much too old to remember that. My memory is terrible. It's really important that you believe that you have a good memory. Remember, we are what we think. You want to give yourself positive, reaffirming messages all day long that you are capable of remembering. For those of us who care about an older adult, you want to try to catch them when they're engaging in this kind of self-talk. If you hear them saying something negative about their abilities, empower them with more positive options. Now here's an awesome recommendation, sleep yourself into better memory. There's a very intimate relationship between sleeping and the formation of memories. And this is one of those concepts that I'm so excited to tell you about because it's so interesting and it's so important. 
Research has shown us that deep sleep, particularly stages four and five, are critical for memory formation. And a really interesting thing happens during these stages of sleep. Two parts of our brain replay the events of the day and try to make a group decision about what should be stored in memory and what's not that important and can be thrown out. Again, remember how many things we're exposed to every day. We couldn't possibly remember it all. So the hippocampus, those memory centers of the brain, and our frontal lobes actually trade notes all night long when we're in stage four and five sleep. And they try to figure out how important is this information. Things that are threatening are particularly reviewed during this time. If you remember from a previous lecture, I taught you that emotional memories, emotional experiences, especially conflict, are very much processed during sleep. And it's during this important stage four and five because our brain has to try to learn the lesson. The goal of the brain is ultimately survival. So anything that threatens our mental or physical well being is taken very seriously. One of the things that happens though as we age is that our sleep changes and particularly our deep sleep and our REM sleep gets more fragmented. If you're over 50, you know that it gets harder and harder to sleep in in the morning. If you compare older adults over the age of 60 to younger adults, the older adults have about a 70% decline in deep sleep. But if you tune into the sleep lecture, you're gonna figure out all sorts of free and very low cost things that you can do to get more deep sleep every single night. The final recommendation that I wanna leave you with is to consider a neuropsychological evaluation. If you feel after learning all of this information about memory that there is something to genuinely be concerned about or you're concerned about somebody that you love. I feel strongly that as neuropsychologists, we are in the best position to help people understand exactly what is going on with their memory. And more important, we can guide you to treatment recommendations that will actually work. Until we know the exact cause of memory loss, we really are operating in the dark for what to do about it. We're not able to tell without the tools of neuropsychology where exactly the problem lies. I hope that I taught you today about how complex memory is, how it's really not as simple as a good memory or a bad memory. I hope that I've taught you some things that you can start to apply today to improve your memory. Thank you so much for joining us and I will see you next time.